The Church We Can Be is the series that we're doing over the next five weeks and it's going to coincide, we hope, in the next few weeks with the release of my second published book, The Church We Can Be, following on from The Me I Can Be, which you all bought last year and read it, then bought an extra copy and passed on to other people. Isn't that right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, so, I wanted to put down in writing the deepest convictions uh, that I have about the Church of Jesus and also to share my own story of being part of a church. I love the Church of Jesus Christ. I've only ever been in two churches all my life. From the moment I, even six months before I gave my heart to Christ, uh, I fell in love with the church. And, um, and I can tell you that church was so different to me. I was saying to some people up in my office during the break that I was hippie, hair down to here, peace badges, smoking, tobacco, and some weed. Anyway, it was illegal, we don't do that anymore. And, um, <laughs> and tobacco, all that stuff. And Man, I was a wild boy, getting drunk, chasing girls. Uh, that was my life, involved in, in sport, playing hooky, wasn't, didn't take school seriously. Um, you remember the moratoriums in Adelaide where we stopped the traffic in King William Street in 1970? That was me. <laughs> and about 10,000 others. Like We just wagged school, teachers got upset with us, and we were saying, we're not going to Vietnam, you know, and uh, so we were... So I was really left of centre in my politics, real radical. Not quite communist, but almost there. And I go into this church that is politically right-wing. They sing God Save the Queen. <laughs> and at that stage, it was like, what? Now I love Her Majesty. I think she's fantastic. May she reign forever and ever. I have not known life without Queen Elizabeth II. Have you? What an amazing person. Who wants her? Burnt out politician up there as president. Good night. Give me the queen. Give me Charles. Give me whoever it is. Anyway, I'm just teasing some of you. Don't write me letters. And I met this guy called David Hersey. Now, he was the straightest of the straight. I mean, Mr. Conservative in every way. And, and in fact, I thought he was so holy, he didn't want to hang around me. I'm, I'm wild. So culturally, the church was out there. Culturally, I was there. And yet I fell in love with those people before I gave my life to Christ. Why? Because I saw the preachers up there. Man, did they share about Jesus with amazing conviction. They, they opened up the Bible in a way that, that I never understood. They worshipped Jesus and centred everything around him. And there was a tremendous love for people and a concern for people. And I felt that love. And so I, I just was drawn in to the presence of Christ, the ministry of God's word, the love of God's people, and gave my life to Christ. And I never stopped attending for nearly, nearly eight years. Then God called me to come here, uh, newly married in 1978, the Christian Family Centre, 40 years ago almost. And I don't think I've missed a Sunday. Uh, I just don't, I, I really don't get it when people say, well, I'm spiritual. I've got nothing with, well, Jesus is okay, but the church people, no, don't like them. Eh? It's kind of like, what are you talking about? How can you say, I love Jesus, but hate people? How can you say, I... I, I, I'm spiritual, but I don't want to be connected with other people that are, that are spiritually minded. And um, one day as I was reading the letter to the Ephesians, and I, I mention this because we're reading it at the moment. What chapter are we up to now? Chapter 3? And the book, the, the Me I Can Be, is really an opening up of that amazing letter. I mean, I love that letter of Paul. In fact, I could, if, if that put me in prison, I reckon I could write it out almost word for word. I've memorized it almost. It, it's such a part of my, my life. And I, to understand 
who Jesus is and who I am in him and the victory of the cross and the, the way that he smashed the devil's authority and empowered us. And oh, I mean, I just love it. Who I am in Christ. You know, I'm in Christ. Christ is in me. Christ is working through me. It's like, and it's all in that book and you can buy it at the end of the service. But then one day I got the revelation about the church. As I'm reading it, and, and it's not long to read, it's only six chapters. I've probably read it hundreds of times now. And it dawned upon me the amazing, um, captivating images, wonderful metaphors that Paul uses about his church. He talks about church being a bride, a body, human body, a beautiful bride, and a victorious army. And uh, my mind started spinning as, as I reflected on that and started writing down some thoughts and, and really the opening chapter of, of the book opens this up. The bride image is all about heart, the love of God. The body image is all about the mind and the, how God orders his body to function effectively and, and the hand regarding the army is about power and overcoming. And... Um, We've got a couple of lovebirds that have returned from their honeymoon, you know, and, and they've probably held hands in the service there, you know, as they're singing, no doubt, because they're, they're still in honeymoon. Actually, I saw Michael and Tracy worshipping Jesus and holding hands. You, you know, you know like you've been married for a long time. What's going on? <laughs> Is there still passion? Is there, I think there's some passion and intimacy and, and like, oh, I think he likes her and she likes him and holding hands and another hand lifted to Jesus. I mean, that's beautiful to see. Yeah. Kathy, why don't you do that with me? <laughs> She's going to fix me up tonight, I tell you. <laughs> and, but the bride image is a wonderful image. And Paul doesn't apologize. He doesn't apologize of what he says about it. He says it's about love. It's about intimacy. It's about and this bridegroom, Jesus, and this bride, the church, is like the love between each other, the intimacy, the fellowship, the care, the, the, the language that Paul uses is just absolutely beautiful. And you know what? That's how he views you as a bride. As a bride. As a bride. And he so wants intimacy and relationship. And, and, and when you get that on the inside, you realize, you know what? He never, the honeymoon's never over for Jesus. It's never over. He just pants after you. He loves you. He doesn't condemn you. And even when you run astray, even when you do things wrong, it's like you might hurt him, but he doesn't hate you. You might offend him, but he doesn't reject you. He prays, Father, help them, Holy Spirit, demons, get away, angels, be unleashed. I mean, he is praying for you to last the distance, to persevere till the end, until he comes, or until he calls you home. He never gives up. He is your bridegroom. It's a powerful image. And then the body, oh, I mean the body, made up of thousands of parts yet somehow it works coordinated together like right now I'm thinking I need a drink so there's a brain cell that goes straight to my heart and muscles go to work <laughs> chemicals neurological spasms and muscles all working together like what is that it's amazing it just is the human body you think a thought I saw a program the other day, a woman had her arm, her arm was cut off, well, didn't say why, excuse me, will I enjoy my drink? <laughs> and they've got this new prosthetic. So somehow, these super brainy people, they've got, they've put some kind of receptors here that can pick up the nerve, the nerve endings connecting, and then they put the prosthetic in... And it's not a mechanical thing. She thinks a thought, I need a drink. And her hand moves and she gets it. I thought, that is fantastic. Amazing, isn't it? The body. 
so many parts and yet all working together with movement and going forward and, and, and unity. That's how he sees you. Every one of you are an important part to the body of Christ called the Christian Family Centre at Seton. Right now, every one of our lead pastors of our CFC churches are preaching the same message. I've sent them a draft of the book. Well, not all of them, but most of them are. So we so believe in the importance of being the church we can be. We're saying, you know what, we want everyone to, to be thinking along this line. And I'm praying that God will change some paradigms in our hearts and minds over the next few weeks on this. And so the body works together. It's well ordered. You, you, you are fabulously made. You have a particular gift and a particular role. And if you don't know what that gift and that role is and learn to function in it, this body can't work properly. It's like the hand going, well, this hand needs to work with this hand. You may be a hand, you may be a foot, you may be an eye, you may be an ear. You can't say, well, I'll just keep it to myself. No such animal. In, in, in Ephesians, if he has saved you, he has saved you to serve his purposes. And not just that, he gifts you with certain abilities and he says, find out what they are, learn about it. I've got a whole schedule of how you can do that in the book. And then fly like the eagle. Use those gifts for my glory within my church. And then the body works and functions together beautifully, amazingly, how it works. You might say, oh man, I'm just the, I'm just the appendix. Useless. Bit of flesh that should be cut out of every person. I cut mine out when I was seven. I don't have one. People say, oh, you didn't miss anything. You know what? I am missing something. They've discovered there's a special bacteria in that jolly little appendix that is very important for your gut health. You didn't know that, did you? Well, check out Mr. Google. He'll tell you all about it. <laughs> there's no useless part to your body. There's no useless part in the Christian Family Center. You might say, I'm just brand new and I've got a lot of problems. Welcome. Welcome to the family. If you really knew me, you wouldn't be saying that. Well, Jesus knows you more, and he's brought you here. So if you're good enough for Jesus, you're good enough for me. Does that make sense? So therefore, it is imperative that you not despise who you are and how God has made you or wired you. And we're going to open this up a little bit more, but I'm telling you, this body image is liberating for everyone. This church would fall over if we didn't have the body functioning. You notice my prayer with Joe and, and Sam, if you heard it. I'm praying God use them to raise up leaders, to raise up people. They're not just to do all the work of ministry. They're to help us, the body, the parents, the family, for you as, as family members to be able to raise your kids even better, for the teams here that function to develop and grow so that the body becomes healthy. And then the army image, wow, isn't that something? And he, he talks about being fully armed, weapons in your hand, defensive pieces of armory. I mean, Paul's locked up in prison. So what's he do with his time? He's, he's talking to soldiers and he's leading them to Jesus. Right under Caesar's nose. Caesar sends his Praetorian guards to him. That's the, the personal bodyguard of, of, of the emperor. So he's got a captive audience. You know, he does, he leads them to Jesus. And a whole pile of people get saved. And the Praetorian Guard, get this, because they had to protect, they were like the secret police, the Gestapo, the, the, the FBI, and so the, the emperor would send them all over the empire into police stations just to check out the local cops that are there and the local soldiers, there's no sedition. So these Praetorian Guards are the most loyal, noble people, loyal to the emperor, and they're going everywhere. These converted Praetorian guards, have a guess what they're doing in Britain and Syria. They're sharing about Jesus. So Paul loves soldiers. And he actually says at the end of Philippians, he goes, all the saints here in Rome salute you, especially those in Caesar's household, dig, 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 like under Caesar's nose, he's leading his top soldiers to Christ. So he loves soldiers and he, he somehow gets hold of the armory and the weaponry and says, you know what? This is what we are. We're soldiers. Jesus is our general. 
And we're soldiers and we've got to put on the shield of faith. Take on the shield of faith. Take the sword of the spirit, helmet of salvation. Shoes shod with the preparation for the gospel to, 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 to speak it. The belt of truth that holds everything else. The armor of breastplate of righteousness and all the, the various pieces. And he says, we're in a warfare. This ain't a Sunday school picnic. This is spiritual warfare. The devil hates you. And the way that he gets to God is by trying to hurt you and hinder you and to harm you. And Paul is saying, you've got to realize the victory that's yours through Jesus Christ. And it's no good when the enemy attacks going, I don't know what to do. You know what to do. You resist him firm in your fame. faith. You grab the shield of faith. You grab the sword of the spirit, the word, and you stick it in his guts. And you get the shield up and say, no, no, no. God's word says this. Jesus says that. Get lost, you devil. Don't argue with me. Go and talk to Jesus. He won't talk to Jesus. He's scared of Jesus. And he's scared of you when you put on your weaponry. So he says, this church we can be is an army. And we've got to understand how armies operate. So when you read Ephesians, do you check it out? The imagery that's there. Now, I want to answer a question. And the question is, what is it that's at our core as a Christian family centre, as our church here and our group of churches? What's at our core? What kind of church is the Christian Family Centre? What is it that continually drives us? Well, I can give you the essence of our core in three phrases. At our core, Christian Family Centre churches do and have three things. The first one is we have a guiding compass. And every navigator's got to have a compass. And our guiding compass is the scriptures, God's word, the Bible. You can put it on the screen, guys. And the scripture, 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture, from Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation 21, is God-breathed and is useful. God breathes through the word. He breathed upon men to write it and he breathes upon us to be able to interpret it and apply it. To teach us, to guide us, to rebuke us, to correct us, to train us in righteousness. Our guiding compass is the scriptures and we must never, ever, ever deviate from it. The day a Christian deviates from scripture and from submitting to the authority of scripture, their vision of Jesus will get dim. So at our core, we have a guiding compass, the Bible, God's word. We also have a true north, and our true north is Jesus. Because the scriptures, their whole theme is about Jesus. The whole Old Testament points to him. The whole New Testament unveils him to us. Without an understanding of the Holy Scriptures, you will not fully comprehend who Jesus is and who you now can be in him when you place your faith in him, who, who loves you and died on a cross for you and rose for you. And some of you here today don't know him, but he's been drawing you and your heart is being moved and, and, uh, and somehow you, you, there's a battle going on. And that battle's good. I went through that for about six months. And uh, there's a tug and there's a movement in our hearts as the Holy Spirit draws us, as we see Jesus loving us, dying on a cross for us, rising for us, being resurrected, going to heaven, sending the Holy Spirit, saying, I love you, I've got plans for you, I want to transform your life, I want to heal you of your sins and your past, I want to forgive you, I want to give you a peaceful life and be connected with God the Father and have right relationships with other people, I'll give you power to live now and a home in heaven when your time comes to go and be with him. This is our Jesus, our, our true north. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Can we put that scripture up? John 14, 6. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is so politically incorrect today. Folks, there is no other way by which you can experience salvation and be assured of heaven unless you put your faith in Jesus Christ. Every other religion, every other philosophy of man, every other religion of man has good things in them. People say, oh, you know, all other religions are of the devil. Not necessarily, no. There's some weird stuff out there that can be a bit occultish, but I've read and studied, did a whole course at university on religious studies, and there's a lot of good things in there. 
But it's man trying to find meaning and purpose and, and, and to search for God. And that's very noble. But the Christianity is God searching for us and revealing himself and sending his son to show us what he's like. It's a revealed religion. It's not a searching for religion. It's a revealed faith. It's given to us as a gift. And uh, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and no one can come to the Father. In Acts 4.12 it says, there is salvation. There can be salvation in no other name except Jesus. And in saying that, we do not put down other religions, other philosophies, other people who are not believers. Our heart aches for them. We want them to come to faith. We're not saying we're better than them. God forbid. As Billy Graham says, we're just one beggar telling another beggar where to find food. We found the food of life, Jesus Christ. I have Muslim friends, and they are fantastic people. Every, get this, every Muslim person I've met here in Australia is a fabulous person. Really good people. Now you might say, oh, Pastor Bill, but you know, don't listen to all the extreme talk because of 0.01% of crazies. There's 0.01% of Christians that are crazies too. And 0.01% of Hindus that are crazy and atheists, but most people are normal and just live their lives. They want to get married, have kids, function, etc. in life. God loves every Muslim in Australia and he wants to reach them with the gospel. And the only way is by befriending and being nice and revealing Jesus to them. Hindus, Buddhists, hey, Char and Kim. Remember when they came to the church how many years ago? He was a Buddhist that couldn't speak English. And we hired him as our caretaker and coffee maker. Are you crazy, Bill? No, my wife is, and Norm is, because they said that we should do it. I said, no. I said, what are you talking about? We can't have a Buddhist and a, who can't speak English making coffees. He was speaking Korean. This just shows you how I don't run the church. The church is not run by committees. It's actually Jesus that speaks, and he speaks to Kathy, and he spoke to Norm, and Kathy comes to me and says, I think we found our new caretaker. And she told me, I said, and I'm talking to this. I said, no. Let's just go and talk to Norm. He'll, he'll fix you up. He was the administrator. So at the end of the time, they came and saw me and said, we think they had this look on them. We think God has sent them. And, and then Kim was a lapsed Presbyterian, whatever that means. <laughs> but she could speak a little bit of English. Now they're on fire for Jesus, giving their hearts to him. She's about to graduate with a university degree. He's the best barista in Australia. And he's been our forever caretaker. Amazing. Amazing. Jesus brings people in. He brings people in, all kinds of people. Each of us have a, has a story. He doesn't make mistakes. He's our true north. And he is our saviour. And he brings people from the four corners of the earth. And here within our church, we've probably got about 60 different nationalities. People either born overseas or the sons of immigrants like like myself. We had a couple of police, a couple of ministers from the state government come and hand that 50,000 bucks to us, you know, for the air conditioning. You know that story? Yeah, we've got $50,000 to help us pay off the air conditioning in the community hall. And um, I just shared with them and talked with them. And they're young enough to be my kids. So when you reach my age, you can say things that you couldn't say. So I told them the story about my dad. He said, my dad was the first boat person. He said, yeah, he came here illegally. 1938, jump ship. And when the captain says, when you find Vasilaka, send him to Perth. He was a merchant navyman. So they, they hides in a fruit truck. They send him up to Streaky Bay. Becomes friends with the local cop. Falls in love with an Aussie girl, actually. And um, not my mum, somebody else, I found out. <laughs> he wouldn't talk a lot about that one. Anyway, so... So World War II breaks out, and they have an amnesty, and they say, yeah, all illegals, you know, we know you're here, <laughs> own up, just in case you're German or Italian, you know, or Japanese. So Dad goes to the local police station, the local cops knew him. They said, you're an illegal. Yep. Australia had no immigration policy in those days anyway, we just followed Great Britons. And uh, so anyway, Dad... They let him stay, but they got him conscripted. He was, they said, you've been in the army? Yeah, in Greece. Okay. 
go to Papua New Guinea or the abattoirs in, in Port Lincoln? What's it going to be for 18 months? He goes, abattoirs in Port Lincoln. <laughs> so he did his nash, he did his service there. And um, so anyway, what I'm saying is, there's my dad, illegal, comes in, never gets a cent from government welfare, serves, thinks he's going to go back to Greece. That's why he didn't marry the girl in Streaky Bay. He said, how can I take an Aussie girl back there? I need to marry a Greek girl because if I'll go back. He didn't realise he was going to stay. And then he produced four kids and all of us. And uh, so he, he, this is, I see the hand of Jesus in there. Then my dad came to Christ and my mum. I led them to Christ. They were coming here. So you just see, you see that the hand of Jesus, he, don't, he makes no mistakes. He is the saviour of the world. And if he has marked you out for salvation, you can't escape him. So it's better for you to give up today than next year. He's going to get you with his love and his kindness. You can fight him and you can reject him, but man, you're going to, it's not going to be nice. He's just saying, come on, son, give up that poison. I'm going to give you the water of life. I'm going to give you the bread of life. Eat of me and you'll be satisfied in life. Nothing else will satisfy you. He's our true north. For God so loved the world. Look at this scripture. John 3.16 Because the third thing that's our, at our centre is our Father's heart. Love for people. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. At our core, our guiding compass is the Bible, God's word. Our true north is Jesus. He's the way, the truth and the life. He is the head of his church He's the one who we acknowledge and draw people to. And thirdly, at our core, we, we, we have seen and experienced the Father's love for all people. That's why we say we're a church for all people. God loves people. He really loves people. He loves you and he likes you. He likes people. He doesn't want any to perish. He wants them all to have eternal life and live with him forever and ever. That's why he says, God so loved the world. He doesn't love some of the stuff the world does. But he loves the world. He gave his one and only son, the prince of heaven, his, the most priceless, priceless thing in his, in his existence, his son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now the challenge of history clearly reveals that we gradually drift off the centre. And uh, yes, even here at the Christian Family Centre, it can happen. Church history reveals that churches and Christians start off well. The scriptures. It's like the Sturt Street Church, the mother church of our CRC, when I came in there, even though culturally it was different to me, they upheld the scriptures. They glorified Jesus. They genuinely loved people. It, it, it got me. It got me. It's never left me. I've been captivated by this. I've never graduated from it. Oh, Bill, don't you go into deeper teaching? There ain't no deeper teaching. This is, this is, this is, the, I'm still exploring the depth of this. Exploring the scriptures. Understanding who Jesus is. And trying to love more people than ever before. To be a better lover of people today than I was in my 60s than I was in my 50s and 40s. I want to become a, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be a better person. A better lover of people. That's what the church is all about. But the church can drift off centre. And even here at the Christian Family Centre. And it's broken my heart. I tell you, don't break my heart by drifting away. If you want to know what brings me to tears and upsets me more than anything, is people that have come to Christ and have been part of the life of the church, and then they forget the Word of God. They forget the Scriptures. And, and, and if you forget the scriptures from reading it and meditating on it and, and applying it, you, 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 you will get blindsided about Jesus. You won't, you won't be drawn to him. You'll disconnect from Jesus. And you'll become centric rather than radic, which is a missiological term. Centric means where you're focusing on yourself and your life and not others. Whereas a radic person, it's all about others predominantly. And the things they do for self are not selfish, are self-interest, but they're radic. And so if you forget the scriptures, you'll get disconnected from Jesus and you'll become centric rather than radic. And uh, 
And I've seen that over the years, and I think, oh man, that is just awful when that happens. Hey, in my own life, our church in the first 10 years from 1976 to 86, this is true, we were probably one of the most successful growing, successful churches in Adelaide. We were the talk of town, we were the flavour of the month. For those of you that were here, from 15 people in 1976 and, and uh, Mark's dad, Pastor Ray, started it in his shed. I was the preacher, I think, the following week on the Sunday night. I came in in 78. The church was probably 30 to 50 people as such. Say 30 committed, another 20, 30 hanging around the edges. Um, but um, in, the, in the 80s, it grew. I mean, we really grew. From, from 76 to 86, it grew amazingly. And so, for those of you that were around, Tin Cathedral, 15 Holbrooks Road, Montrose Avenue, the Findon or Seton Scout Hall, West Beach Primary School, Grange Primary School, and then the Lord provided this land in 1982, 81, 82, and put up this facility. We dedicated it in November 1986. I mean, the church is powering along. Hundreds of people are being reached. So many commitments. I mean, it was an amazing time. And yet early 1987, I was about to quit. In the midst of being so successful, most of you don't realise that. I put it in my book and I open it up in the next book, The Leader I Can Be. The crisis I went through. It was my second big crisis, 83, 87. And I nearly handed the church on to Pastor Hans, subject to the board endorsing it. He came in from Melbourne to assist us and he just, just came in for a few, few months. I thought, oh man, I'm out of here. I'm going back teaching. Like, like, I just, it was just difficult. Blessings of God, but I found myself having made some stupid decisions and uh, matters to do with leadership both in the church and outside the church where I just was incompetent, basically. I didn't know what I was doing. I knew how to preach. I knew how to counsel, but I really didn't know about leadership and management. I didn't know about multi-staff and, and all of that. That's not what we were taught in Bible college. So I go to Papua New Guinea in 1987 and uh, with great aspirations to go and help them. I had visions of for three months beforehand, my first overseas mission trip, I'd pray and fast a day a week and really go prepared with great resources and go there and bless Barry and the team. Well, I was so in a dark place that the night before I go to Papua New Guinea, I just grab a few files out of my file, threw them in my bag, dusted the dust off my feet, not from my family, just to think, I've got to get out of here. I unprepared and I went to Papua New Guinea and I thought I was going to quit. But thankfully, Barry Silverback and my fellow pastors in, in Port Moresby, they were the answer for me. And I still remember our times of prayer. I just shared with Barry. And, uh, and if you know Pastor Barry Silverback, he's not really a counsellor. Like, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Like, he says, we better pray. I want to talk. We better pray. I said, when? Oh, well, I start my appointments at 6, 5 in the morning. I'm, in, I'm sleeping till 7. Lectures don't start till nine. I'm up at five and he's in his office and we're praying. And I still remember this because, you know, when you hold hands and pray, you get in the grip first, the, the easy grip. <laughs> well, he, he came in quicker. And so I'm like this. So after half an hour, and he's praying in the spirit, I'm thinking, let's stop praying like this is hurting me. And he's praying. He's rebuking every demon from Port Moresby to Adelaide. He's praying the blessing of God upon me. For about three or four days we did this. And... And then at the end, after we finished praying, he just said, in five minutes, you know, Bill goes, I've been thinking about what you said. He just said, do, 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 just said, he didn't say, thus saith the Lord. It was like Jesus had just turned up and he actually unlocked something in me that I saw something I had never seen before in my life about me. I thought, wow. I came back, and I can tell you, with that crisis, I realised our church, successful, was totally centric. We were just concerned for Adelaide. No concern for even just the western suburbs. We hadn't even fully realised we're a church of the city. We're just focusing on, I'm busy just looking after people in the... We're a church of the city. 
one third of coming from 30 miles, you know, from 30 minutes away, we weren't concerned for South Australia, Australia, or the world. Yet we were successful, but we were centric. We were more self-focused. Something broke, and from that time on, I became fully radic from 87 onwards. And it's interesting, from 1990, that's when we started planting our churches. Bang! 25 attempts of planting churches. We got 12 churches up and running and outreaches, and more than that, we gave our best. See, back in the 80s, I thought, well, we've got to do church planting. I didn't give my best. Oh, I'll just give that person, that person, and that one there. Don't like that one. And uh, here's, a here's a troubled, oh, yeah, he'd be he'd like, really immature. Not wise. But when you become radic and others centred and focused, you realise for the sake of the kingdom, you've got to give your best. Our best pastors, our best leaders, our best people. And, uh, and so from that time on, when the Lord healed my heart, sorted me out, I became fully radic. And the church, I think, has been on that road probably from 1990 onwards. The, the transformation occurred in late 1980s. And so world missions and church planting, outreaching has become part and parcel of our... And so the challenge of history reveals to us that it's easy to forget the word, to disconnect from Jesus, and to become centric rather than radic. Now, can I encourage us as a church to recommit ourselves to never move from our changeless core. Oh, I wish I had another hour I could share with you. You've got to get the book. When the book comes in, you've got to read that. Oh, chapter one's fantastic. Come I'm preaching tonight as well, aren't I? Yep. I forgot about that. I'm doing the same message, but a little bit, little bit of a different angle. Then I'm doing Friday morning. I'm doing four on this. All of our churches, so we're, we're doing it. So let's never move from our changeless core. Church, can you say amen to that? Amen. Secondly, let's recommit ourselves to staying faithful to God's word and faithfully aligned to God's word. Not just reading it and meditating on it, but aligning your life, your thoughts, your actions to the word. And that can be hard. Thirdly, to always be centered on Jesus. Lift him up. You won't go wrong if you build your life around Jesus and you're talking to him and developing intimacy and relationship. You're the bride. He wants relationship. He wants there to be passion. Is there any passion there with your bridegroom? Think back. Think back when you saw your bride. Think back when you saw your bridegroom all handsome and standing up here. There's passion, there's life, and you just want to be together. What is that? I remember when I was courting Kathy, I was as busy as could be, and I was engaged. Every day I wanted to see her. It might have been 10.30 at night, bang on the window, hey, I'm here. Just need a hug and a cuddle. Now, I come home, she's asleep. <laughs> what is that that drives you? This is, Jesus is, Paul is saying, bride, bridegroom image, it's like, passion for him. That can reignite folks. Like it can reignite in a marriage. It can reignite in your relationship with Jesus. And I tell you the way it does is you discover him in the word again. Get back into scripture. Read the scripture. Meditate. Say God open my eyes. Help me to see. And, and so stay faithfully aligned to God's word. Always be centered on Jesus. And, and let's commit ourselves to becoming more radic and less centric. The decision to put Sam on and, and Joe, these are radic decisions. These are not centric decisions. These, these are costly decisions financially. But we say, you know what, our children, our youth, our young adults, and the, commu the, the kids out, you've got to see the kids on a Friday night when I'm, I'm looking at them off and I think, man, they're a motley crew, some of them. I don't know how many of them are saved, but Sam and the team are working on them hard. And with the kids club, we want to have that Friday thing. What's it, fortnightly, monthly? It's going to be six weeks. Every six weeks. Man, may it be every week during school term. May there be hundreds of kids that come to Christ, hey? Amen. Wow, we need it. Tim and Nikki going to, to, to plant the church down south. We don't 
don't see it as costly, but we are saying, you know what? He stays on salary. We are doing it. We, we are doing it with them. God has called them, and so he stays on salary. We're putting in big bucks to do it. It's going to cost us. But you know what the biggest cost is? My, my per- I was saying to Nikki yesterday, it's going to be really hard. It's going to be hard for me personally and Kathy not to have those three little babies here. And every Sunday they come up and give me a hug. Oh, Babu, love you. They're not going to do that on Sundays. So I've parked that to one side. You know why? Because I'm radic. And I realise, it doesn't stop me being a, a good granddad, but you know, like you, we've got to get out of ourselves, our comfort line, and what's our inconveniences for the sake of the kingdom, to be outwardly focused, to be outreach oriented, a church for all people. That's who we want to be. Never move from our changeless course. Stay faithfully aligned to God's word. Always be centred on Jesus and, be, and to become more radic rather than centric. Can you say amen to that? Let's stand together. I'd like to pray for you.